on World News Tonight. Tit for tat. Tensions between India and Canada escalate as a row over assassinated Sikh leader deepens. Swapped. US bound plane leaves Doha with five Americans freed by Iran in a six billion US dollar deal. Just launched. Apple releases iOS 17, adding new features and designs for compatible devices. And Aurora Borealis. Stunning northern lights seen over parts of North America amuses the masses. This is Adha Derana World News Tonight. Reporting from Colombo, here is Anuradhi Vikramasinghe. A very good evening and thank you for joining us on World News. We begin tonight with a diplomatic role concerning our neighbour India. Canada's accusation that India may have been involved in the assassination of a Sikh activist on its soil has triggered a growing row with Ottawa and New Delhi, with both countries expelling senior diplomats, sending relations between the two countries plunging. Canada said on Monday it had credible information linking Indian government agents to the murder of a Sikh separatist leader in British Columbia in June, an accusation India dismissed as absurd and motivated. Canada also said it had expelled a senior Indian intelligence official but gave no details. The separatist leader, Hardeep Singh Najjar, was shot dead outside a Sikh temple in Surrey, British Columbia, on June 18. Najjar supported a Sikh homeland in the form of an independent Khalistani state and was labelled a terrorist by India in 2020, according to Indian media. Canadian Prime Minister Justin Trudeau on Monday did not directly accuse India of being involved. However, he did say his country's security agencies had been pursuing allegations of links between Najjar's death and India's government. Any involvement of a foreign government in the killing of a Canadian citizen on Canadian soil is an unacceptable violation of our sovereignty. It is contrary to the fundamental rules by which free, open and democratic societies conduct themselves. As you would expect, we've been working closely and coordinating with our allies on this very serious matter. Moninda Singh, director of the Canadian Sikh Coalition, said Monday his community wanted to see what Ottawa would do next. We have a mixed kind of emotion right now. Uh, that's kind of uh, one is we're acknowledging that Canada has acknowledged India as an actor and done it from Parliament. Uh, and on the other side, we're wondering what the next steps are going to be as well. So I think there's mixed feelings at the moment. Canada has the highest population of Sikhs outside their home state of Punjab in India. It's also been the site of many demonstrations that have irked India. Monday's announcement will likely further strain bilateral ties, with New Delhi already unhappy that Canadian authorities did not crack down on Sikh protesters. The two countries were earlier trying to hammer out a trade deal by the end of this year, but have now frozen talks. Canada gave few details, while India cited, quote, certain political developments. Over in the U.S., House Speaker Kevin McCarthy is facing the biggest challenge of his eight months as he tries to muster his fractured caucus as the top Republican in the U.S. Congress to avoid an approaching government shutdown. With less than two weeks to go before a possible partial government shutdown, House Speaker Kevin McCarthy arrived at the U.S. Capitol on Monday to face the biggest challenge of his speakership, bring his divided House Republicans together to pass legislation that keeps the government open without losing his job as Speaker. Over at the Treasury Department, its chief, Janet Yellen, warned on Monday that failure by Congress to pass legislation to keep the government running risked slowing momentum in the U.S. economy, telling CNBC, quote, creating a situation that could cause a loss of momentum is something we don't need as a risk at this point. Late on Sunday, hardline and moderate House Republicans agreed on a short-term stopgap spending bill that would beef up border security and keep federal agencies open until October 31st. It would also cut spending by more than 8% at all agencies except for the Department of Defense and Department of Veterans Affairs, but it was not clear whether the proposal, which is dead on arrival in the Democratic-controlled Senate, would even garner enough Republican support to pass the House. 
Hardline activism on spending and an impeachment inquiry into President Joe Biden have split Republicans in the House. I, I think the impeachment inquiry is long overdue. Per and some members of the hardline House Freedom Caucus are openly embracing a shutdown as a negotiating tactic to get their way. Republican Representative Matt Gates has also raised the possibility of ousting McCarthy for not showing more progress on single spending bills and failing to move forward on other terms of the deal McCarthy made to become Speaker, which gave any one House member the power to call a vote for his removal. McCarthy said weekend negotiations with hardliners on legislation had made progress but added, quote, we'll bring it to the floor, win or lose, and show the American public who's for the Department of Defense who's for our military. Unless the House can move forward on spending, Republican leaders say privately that they could be forced to move directly into negotiations with Senate Democrats on appropriations bills, circumventing the hardliners. The goal would be bipartisan legislation that could pass both chambers quickly and be signed into law by Biden. But the consequences could be dire for McCarthy, with Freedom Caucus member Ralph Norman saying, quote, it'd be the end of his speakership. World leaders meeting at the United Nations warned of the peril the world faces unless it acts with urgency to rescue a set of 2030 development goals to wipe out hunger and battle climate change. A to-do list of sustainable development goals set in 2015 appeared to be in peril, according to world leaders meeting at the United Nations this week. Their declaration, adopted by consensus at a summit before the annual UN General Assembly, warns that if there's no urgency soon, the world may soon face serious consequences. A list of 17 development goals were established to wipe out hunger and extreme poverty and battle climate change by 2030. This was not a promise made to one another as diplomats from the comfort of this chamber. It was always a promise to people. UN Secretary General Antonio Guterres told the Summit of Leaders that only 15% of the targets are on track and that many are going in reverse. People crushed under the grinding wheels of poverty. People starving in a world of plenty. People losing hope because they can't find a job or a safety net when they need it. Entire communities literally on devastation's doorstep because of changing climate. the biggest issue of our time and because of that we must be too big and too radical to ignore. Democratic U.S. Representative Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez joined tens of thousands of protesters on Sunday to kick off Climate Week, filling the streets of Midtown Manhattan ahead of the U.N. General Assembly, calling for President Joe Biden and other world leaders to end the use of fossil fuels. We will not Earlier this month, Guterres called on G20 leaders to ensure a stimulus of at least $500 billion per year towards meeting SDG goals. According to a report last year, the cost of meeting global targets rose 25 percent to $176 trillion during the year that ended in September 2022, with performance on several measures reversing. Meanwhile, Russia's government is calling on the United Nations highest court in The Hague to throw out what it says is a hopelessly flawed case, which was brought by Kyiv challenging Moscow's argument that the war is necessary to prevent genocide. Russia is calling on the United Nations highest court to throw out a case brought by Ukraine that challenges Moscow's assertion that the invasion of Ukraine was necessary to stop the genocide of ethnic Russians there. This Ukrainian military video released over the weekend is said to show the battle for a village it says it's retaken. On Monday, Russia's legal team in The Hague said Kyiv was abusing the UN's 1948 Genocide Treaty. Ukraine insists no genocide has occurred. That alone should be enough to reject the case, because according to the court's jurisprudence, if there was no genocide, there cannot be a violation of the Genocide Convention. 
The hearings at the International Court of Justice, also known as the World Court, are set to run until September 27th and will not address the merits of the case. Instead, it will focus on legal arguments about jurisdiction. The court has no way to enforce its decision, and Russia's government has previously ignored court orders to stop its military actions. Experts say a ruling in Kyiv's favor would not stop the war, but could impact future reparation payments. Tonight's road to the White House now. Former U.S. President Donald Trump plans to skip the Republican presidential debate. Instead, he is opting to woo blue-collar voters with a speech in Detroit while a historic strike between auto workers and America's top car makers continue in America. Former U.S. President Donald Trump plans to skip the next Republican presidential debate, instead heading to Detroit next week to speak to a crowd of union workers. That's according to an aide on Monday, who said Trump will forego the debate to insert himself into the dispute between striking workers and the United States' top automakers. The event will mark the second time Trump has skipped a Republican primary presidential debate in this election cycle. Despite facing a string of legal woes, the former president still leads his nearest rival by nearly 50 percentage points, according to recent opinion polls. Trump's speech signals an effort by his team to look beyond the Republican primaries and onto a likely general election rematch with Biden next November. And his address to union members points to a Trump campaign to win back some of the working class voters who defected to Biden in his 2020 victory against Trump. It comes as the United Auto Workers Union began a strike last week against the so-called Detroit Three carmakers over pay and other benefits. It's a labor dispute that could pose a major political threat for Biden. The current president has vocally supported unions for decades, but there is anger among some rank-and-file auto workers that he has not done enough to stand up to the manufacturers and their executives amid huge industry profits. Trump looks set to seize the opportunity to persuade auto workers and other union members that he will be on their side if he becomes president again. The current strike has geographical significance for next year's general election. Many of the affected workers are based in Michigan, Pennsylvania and Wisconsin, three key Midwestern battleground states where the presidential contest could be decided. Welcome back. Now $6 billion of Iranian assets frozen in South Korea have been returned to Iran after a deal with the U.S. Washington and therein subsequently swapped prisoners. The United States and Iran have completed a rare prisoner swap deal after billions of U.S. dollars of Iranian funds frozen in South Korea were released back to Tehran. In a statement on Monday, U.S. President Joe Biden said five Americans who were imprisoned in Iran are finally coming home. These Americans had been detained in Iran for nearly a decade on a number of allegations, including espionage. Separately, Iran state-run media reported that five Iranians held by the U.S. who had been charged with crimes are now free. Two of the five have reportedly landed in Tehran. Citing sources that the swap happened after both sides confirmed that around $6 billion of frozen Iranian assets were transferred from South Korea to Qatar, the mediator of the U.S.-Iran talks. Seoul's Foreign Ministry on Tuesday confirmed that the Iranian funds have been successfully transferred to Qatar. The money had been locked in South Korea due to sanctions imposed by the U.S. following its withdrawal from the Iran nuclear deal in 2018. The frozen funds have become one of the main reasons behind South Korea and Iran's thorny relations, as Tehran has long been demanding that Seoul release the funds. That being said, the ministry also expressed hope to see developments in relations with Iran following the transfer. Meanwhile, Biden thanked South Korea and other countries involved for helping the detained Americans come home. The U.S. president said that he was grateful to the partner countries for their tireless efforts to achieve the goals and thanked the governments of South Korea, Qatar, Oman and Switzerland. U.S. Secretary of State Antony Blinken also thanked South Korea for its close coordination and partnership. 
Although the prisoner swap and release of Iranian funds may appear to be an encouraging development in Washington and Tehran's rocky relationship, tensions are expected to remain high, with Tehran's nuclear program still a sticking point. Tech Bytes now. Today is the day to update to Apple's latest operating system, the iOS 17, and unlock a slew of new features that promise to make the iPhone experience more personal and intuitive. Apple is rolling out iOS 17 today, including a series of new features for iPhones. The new operating system includes a standby mode with information users can see from a distance when your iPhone is charging. And there's live voicemail that transcribes messages in real time. TikTok is looking to give its online marketplace a boost. According to Bloomberg, TikTok Shop will offer discounts for the holiday shopping season. The hope is that slashing prices up to 50% will spur competition with the likes of Amazon, and Walmart. Finally, Meta is making Horizon Worlds more accessible. It's making the Super Rumble game available to a small number of mobile users through the Meta Quest app on Android and iOS devices. And if you want to play on a desktop, you can request access through Horizon's website. Days of tension in Sudan as buildings have caught fire in Sudan's capital after heavy fighting between the army and the rival forces. Videos posted online also show the iconic Greater Nile Petroleum Oil Company tower engulfed in flames. This is one of Sudan's main landmarks in Khartoum. It has now been reduced to a smoldering wreck amid heavy fighting between rival military factions. The Greater Nile Petroleum Operating Company head office a glass-sided tower topped with a coil of metal was built during an oil boom before South Sudan declared independence in 2011. It was one of Sudan's most costly constructions. The building is located close to areas fought over by Sudan's army and the paramilitary rapid support forces. Videos released by the RSF on Sunday showed flames and smoke rising from the building in a financial district of the capital. It is unclear what caused the fire that burned through the tower from Saturday. The RSF accused the army of targeting it along with other important buildings, part of an effort to dislodge paramilitary fighters from positions they occupied across the capital early in the conflict. Sudan's foreign ministry, which is aligned with the army, released a statement on Monday accusing the RSF of setting fire to a number of major economic institutions and commercial buildings over the past two days, but did not specifically refer to the tower. The war between the army and the RSF broke out in mid-April, when tensions linked to an internationally backed plan for a political transition boiled over, four years after longtime ruler Omar al-Bashir was overthrown during a popular uprising. The conflict has caused widespread clashes, looting and shortages of food and medicine in Khartoum and other cities, driving more than five million people from their homes. A few thousand people have demonstrated in front of a French military base in Niger's capital. The protesters demanded the departure of French soldiers from the country. Thousands of protesters descended upon Niger's French military base on Saturday after French President Emmanuel Macron said the ambassador they have been calling to leave was being held hostage. The demonstrations began in early September, around five weeks after soldiers toppled President Mohamed Bazoum and seized power in a coup. The move has been widely condemned abroad, but celebrated by many at home. Protesters gathered outside the base to demand its troops, as well as the French ambassador, to leave the country. Hundreds are camped there, vowing to occupy the base's front entrance until their demands are met. Relations between Niger and its former colonizer France have worsened since Paris declared the junta illegitimate, stoking anti-French sentiment. French President Emmanuel Macron said on Friday that France's ambassador in Niger is being held hostage at the French embassy by the military junta. Niger's military leaders ordered the ambassador's expulsion late last month, but Paris rejected it saying it still regards democratically elected Bazoum, currently held prisoner, as the country's sole legitimate leader.
Welcome back. For more news, let's take you around the world in a minute. The Chilean government has confirmed that torrential rains has hit southern Chile have left two people dead and one missing. Malaysia Karwa, an underprivileged teenager from a waterfall slum in Mumbai, has become an overnight sensation in the face of Indian cosmetics brand Forest Essentials. In Peru, at least 24 people, including children, have been killed in a bus crash. Over a dozen others were reportedly injured. Bulgaria said that it used a control blast to destroy explosives on a device attached to a drone that landed in a Black Sea town. The country's defense minister said the device is presumably linked to Russia's war against Ukraine. The UN Cultural Agency listed an ancient Guatemalan city first occupied as early as 800 BC as a World Heritage Site. This is the third site of the country to gain the recognition. And that is all we have for you on World News Tonight. If you missed any of today's programs, you can always re-watch by catching us on our YouTube channel, youtube.com slash English. We are leaving you tonight under the starry skies of North America as the Northern Lights put on a dazzling display over Edmonton in Alberta, Canada. Thank you for watching. Have a great night.